several years ago when Terry Hughes uh, first came and spoke to us at Kabrumpa about the centre and his vision and his plans, what he hoped to achieve. Um, we at Kabrumpa were very keen to be involved um, and excited by the prospects that, uh, that such a centre held. I'd have to say, listening to the speakers yesterday, our, uh, our faith has been rewarded um, and it's uh, wonderful to see a centre with uh, such a hub and a mass of expertise available there to feed into the management of the Great Barrier Reef. It's interesting when you um, hear someone introduce you and they talk about what you've done and what you haven't done a bit. I was just thinking back on things I've done and things that I haven't done. I, I think if you do a self-assessment, which is always dangerous, I probably was not too bad a cattle train drover. I wasn't too bad at land resource assessment. I definitely failed as a diplomat. Um, and uh, of course, I'm a failed fisheries manager as well, but, but I'm not alone there. Um, and I guess I'm part, part, I'd like to think I'm partially successful as a marine park manager. But anyhow, those two failures, the, uh, the fisheries management and the um, my time in Brussels, I think probably provide a bit of a context uh, for this talk today. So, today I'm going to talk just a little bit about the marine park and I think, you know, I'll go through that fairly quickly. Obviously, there's been lots of um, discussion made over the, over the last day or so and, and yesterday evening about the marine park and what it is and where it is and so forth. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going and what we're doing. I'm going to speak about the role of the community, which I think is particularly relevant um, to this forum and to management of the marine environment, uh, not just in the Great Barrier Reef, but around the world. Um, and then I'm going to have a, spend a bit of time, hopefully, uh, making some shocking generalisations about the roles of science and management. And uh, my, my intention there is to evoke um, some discussion amongst participants uh, over morning tea. I'd like to have a bit of a whinge before I finish, if you don't mind. I know it's self-indulgent, but... Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about what we need to do a better job. So the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, as I said, I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, we know where it is. It's quite a unique um, phenomenon in that uh, it was established back in 1975, and we had some interesting introduction to that in terms of coral mining and um, the threats of the time, crown of thorns, petroleum exploration as to how it came about. Um, it's the one area where Commonwealth jurisdiction comes into low water around the coastline of Australia and that's particularly important. Um, it's nine, it makes up 99% of the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, so essentially the two are the same. Um, and very importantly, though not often spoken about, it has a complementary state marine park that abuts it on the shoreline. And um, this is particularly um, unique, in my experience, to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and very important as to how it's managed and how it functions. It's a huge area, which is a challenge in itself to manage. Um, we couldn't achieve what management we do without the support and the partnership we have with Queensland, the Queensland government agencies, and in particular Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, who undertake um, the majority of the field management in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And, and our philosophy and that of parks is to manage the islands and the marine areas as seamlessly as possible. And occasionally we even achieve that, which is, which is good. I know we've got a lot of coral phobes here, if that's the right term, um, but I just wanted to state the obvious that the Great Barrier Reef is about more than coral. And just as a healthy coral reef isn't just about healthy coral, it's about the, the um, relationships between the different components. So the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is about a range of healthy, interacting, interconnected habitats. We don't understand a great deal about that interconnection and those relationships, but we know they're important. We know that sea, healthy seagrass is important for a healthy marine environment, is important for the health of the reef, 
We're learning more about an area of great interest to me, which is the deeper water shoals and the role they play, particularly um, as staging posts and nurseries for the fish population. But we don't understand a lot of the dynamics of how it works. The previous speaker ran through um, the, the, uh, some uh, statistics on the values, but as a geographer, I guess I, I like to focus on the fact that they're interrelated and not segment them out so much. And the value of the reef really is the accumu accumulative effect of the social values as well as the economic values, the environmental values, and the cultural and spiritual values. And as someone who grew up um, just outside Townsville in the Great Barrier Reef, um, I have some feeling for the sense of magic and the value of that magic, which has for residents who live along the, the shore as well as visitors who come to the area. I won't go over the figures because we just uh, ran through those. I mean, to, what, what stands out from this and, and this report's on our website from Access Economics if people would like to, uh, like to go into the detail. What stands out for me in this, as other speakers have said, is the high value of tourism. Um, it really underpins the economy of regions along the coast, the coastal towns, in particular Cairns, and I'd urge anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to do it to, if you're trying to get a feel for what drives the economy of the marine park, just go down to the wharf at Cairns at about 8am any day of the week, seven days a week, have a look at the activity, have a look at the vessels that are leaving the port and the people who are on board and you'll get some idea of the magnitude of, um, of activity there is. I should point out that that um, data there for tourism, we found out in the presentation of it, doesn't include any um, expenditure on dive or snorkel equipment um, or tank refills or whatever, which you'd have to think is quite, uh, would be quite substantive. So tourism's probably um, a bit higher than what's actually, actually there. Everyone's, a lot of speakers, sorry, not everyone, but a lot of speakers have mentioned the term resilience, the ability of the system to deal with the threats and pressures that are, that are placed on it. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time running quickly through the major pressures that, uh, that are there. These are in no order of importance and they're well known to, uh, to most people, but um, the reason I go through it is because there's a bit of a tendency around the place um, to talk about the Great Barrier Reef as if it's pristine. And uh, we've had a, um, a number of commentators who have spoken in the press recently about how pristine and how what good shape the Great Barrier Reef is. You know, I think it would be um, naive in the extreme if we didn't focus as well on the pressures that are occurring. So there's been now 150 years of steadily increasing use. Um, in, of the Great Barrier Reef and, and its surrounds. So it's starting to get a bit of history in terms of white settlement at least. The effects and the impacts aren't evenly distributed across the 350,000 square kilometres. It's the inshore area that's most heavily impacted. And um, for those of us who went through the rezoning or examined it, you uh, would understand that the level of protection in terms of the no take or green zones is uh, lowest in that inshore area as a result of the political compromises that took place during the negotiations. We're sitting right on 20% of that inshore bioregion um, and I would say that's where 80% of the conflict was in terms of the user groups, particularly fishing. Remoteness, I worked for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority back in the mid 80s, 86 and 85 and in those days remoteness was a very good manager for the marine park. Um, the fact was, particularly in the far northern section, a large one third of the park, there was very little impact. And, uh, and if you like, management was, uh, was very much assisted by the fact that no one was doing anything to the reef in those areas, pretty much. And of course, climate change um, that's increasingly um, showing its effects and presents, I think, the greatest challenge in terms of us managing the reef and the scientific community assisting us in that. 
just to deal with this issue of it's pristine, and I've gathered some photos. I think they're probably Terry Hughes's photos, these. And, um, um, but I, but I, this, this point of it's pristine, it assumes that, um, and, this is a, and this is a bit of a problem, I think, with, with management all around and with science, that impacts actually start when you start measuring them. Well, that's not the case, of course. Impacts occur much before that. And um, there's been major exploitation of Beche de Mer, um, fisheries. Um, there was a turtle factory on Heron Island, dugongs, of course, and I'll talk a little bit more about those shortly. But as a, as a young child growing up at Saunders Beach, which is a beach north of Townsville, uh, where my grandparents lived, and it was, a, it was a very remote place in those days. There was no bitumen road. It was, a, it was quite a trek to get in there. There's probably about 15 huts down there at that stage. But I can remember walking that beach. So this is the early 60s to mid 60s. I can remember walking that beach lots of times um, and stepping over carcasses of sharks in particular, um, but also dugongs, because they were always interesting. They were bigger. Um, whales small whales. It was not an unusual circumstance and as you know as a, you know, children are always fascinated by that sort of thing so we'd count the number of sharks and we'd drag them back into the water and all that sort of stuff. But um, that era coincided to my mind with the um, introduction of monofilament gill nets along the east coast and everyone had one. I mean that's one of those shocking generalisations but we used to get up at four in the morning to go down to the beach. We used to use um, uh, seine nets off the beach. But you could purchase a, mono, a gill net licence from the Queensland Government, I think it was about four pounds in those days. So lots of electricians, lots of carpenters, lots of cane farmers, as well as fishermen, had monofilament gill nets. And you went out and you could use them basically without restraint. We don't know what the impact of that was on biodiversity, inshore, but it was big. It's not measured. We don't know how to take it into account. But it's very important when we're doing stock assessments or measuring the, the resilience of the ecosystem to understand and to emphasise that we are dealing with a situation where there's been a fair bit of diminishment and impact already. And in particular that inshore biodiversity. Um, we wouldn't know quite frankly, what we've lost in terms of queenfish, um, you know, the trevallies, some of those species that really were regarded as low value and were heavily impacted on by, by um, <coughs> netting. Now, my grandfather tells the story that when he used to fish around Magnetic Island, I asked him, he used to go out on his own overnight, well, not exactly on his own, he always had a few tallies on board, but He'd be out there overnight, and I used to say to him, do you get you know, scared of sharks when you're out there, Grandad? And he, I remember him saying to me clearly, boy, sharks don't worry me. It's those bloody whales. This is around Magnetic Island. They're everywhere, and they're coming up all the time around you, and that's the greatest fear. Well, you could sit out, of course, off Magnetic Island. You know, most nights now, and if you saw a whale, um, it'd be a very rare event. But nothing, I think, perhaps emphasises what I'm talking about here as clearly as the dugong story. So dugongs, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was raising concerns about dugongs and, and their decline for some time. And uh, these are the, this is the data that we were dealing with back um, between 87 and, and 99. The uh, so-called dugong war started about 90, 97, I think it was. I was in fisheries at the time. and. Um, it was quite, it was quite a, a difficult argument to win um, that there was a need to protect some areas from netting because of the impact that netting had and also to get hunting um, removed from the southern Great Barrier Reef. But there was some progress made in that regard. Professor Helene Marsh and uh, Ivan Lawler and colleagues at James Cook then did some analysis based on shark netting data um, from the 1960s and this is the true picture that we were dealing with at that time. So there's been a catastrophic collapse. What caused it in the 1960s? You're not allowed to say this because it's not provable, but I think it's an enormous coincidence that there's the introduction of monofilament as opposed to nylon nets. 
That's when you could set your nets, leave them, go away, and they caught fish on their own. You didn't have to work them. <clears throat> of course, the shark netting bay, the protection program, made a pretty significant contribution to the decline as well. Um, just as an aside, David Wackenfeld was saying to me, we were talking one day, so we've, we think the population estimate of dugongs in the Great Barrier Reef was around 50,000, say at the start of the 1960s. Now, remembering that there's been harvest of dugongs and mortality before that as well, so we're not quite sure what the pristine population uh, would have been, but let's assume it was around 50,000 in the 1960s. What's the ecological effect? We know the, you know, grazers, we know they're herbivores, um, heavily dependent on seagrass, sea limited number of seagrasses. Um, they obviously play a major role in, in nutrient cycling and, um, and uh, in particular on, on seagrasses, of course. But what's the effect of removal of, say, 47,000 of that population <coughs> ecologically? And what are the long-term implications for the habitat and for the ecosystem in general? Um, I don't know. It would be interesting for someone to, uh, to help us with that. In some ways, it's gone and we're struggling to, uh, to protect the dugong that remain. Um, are we going to be successful given the biology of the animal, uh, given the continuing development? Um, I think it's going to be touch and go as to whether there's a viable population of dugongs in the southern Great Barrier Reef. So far this year, we've lost 15. Most of those to netting. We lost another one, I think, two days ago off Armstrong Beach in Mackay. Um, we just simply can't keep on going in this way, in my opinion. Or if we do, everyone should be well aware, policymakers, politicians, scientists, that dugongs may well become a novelty item in the southern Great Barrier Reef. So what do we try and do about issues such as this? Well, we do what we can. And, um, you know, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, is, as several speakers before me have said, is regarded as a well-managed marine area. And I, and I obviously have a vested interest in saying it is, um, but I've been pointing out some of the problems. So we try and influence fisheries management, given that we have this situation where there's, um, Queensland has direct responsibility for management of the fisheries in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Um, since 98, we've developed expertise in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority on fisheries. It was partly, I guess, why I was appointed. Um, and we work at trying to influence the Queensland Government um, in those management measures that they put in place. Occasionally, we will intervene directly. It'll be interesting to see what the future holds there for us. Tourism. We've worked very closely with the tourism industry and have a healthy partnership there. With tourism, very few of them don't get the importance of maintaining their sites and minimising their impacts because it's quite directly related to the competitiveness of their, of their enterprise. And you see this feedback all the time. So, for instance, in the rezoning of the Marine Park, the tourism industry was very keen on green zones and, in fact, you know, would have liked more. And I think at one stage their policy was 50%. The water quality plan, water quality deterioration, a major issue, a long-term issue for the Great Barrier Reef um, and for many in marine environments around the world. Are we on top of that? I th certainly think we've got a good framework in place to tackle it, but the next five years are going to be quite critical in terms of on-ground action, moving those plans and that science into, into policy and management um, interventions. Um, I think an important part there has been the transparency that's come into that debate as a result of a lot of the work that's being done, particularly by scientists, um, but also the Marine Park Authority, so that the community and the public have an, and the politicians have a good understanding. And I acknowledge the work that John Brodie um, and his colleagues have done in that regard. The rezoning, a major exercise that just about broke the authority uh, in more ways than one. Um, a very successful exercise, and everywhere I go around the world, it is generally applauded as the most significant step in marine conservation, um, certainly in, in more recent times. And I'm continually asked, as are, as are my colleagues, to go and talk to other jurisdictions about how was it achieved. 
Um, and hopefully we'll have the definitive write-up of that um, available before too much longer. But um, as Terry, you said yesterday, is it going to save the Great Barrier Reef? And I think Russell Reichelt said it as well. Look, it's a fantastic foundation, but we should not relax and rest and think that all the problems have been solved because of this rezoning. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, we need to evaluate its effectiveness and how it's going. And two, if we just sit back and don't implement it, then there's no shortage of example of paper parks around the world, and this could be another one. Um, the traditional use of marine resource agreements, early days we have two in place, one with the Wapabara people from around the Keppels, one with uh, Girrigan Mob, which is six saltwater peoples um, from Rolling Stone up to uh, Mission Beach. Another one with Mamu is not far off, that's the, the, uh, the um, traditional owners from around Innisfail, and, um, and hopefully one with Wootertee up on Shelburne Bay. We have set up a climate change group in the authority, and you may be familiar with some of the work that they've done. Dr Paul Marshall is heading up that group. Their job is to help across the agency with adaptation um, and understanding of the implications of climate change. And I guess the big paradigm shift, if you like, for us has been following on from the rezoning and the community consultation that occurred as part of that to uh, to involve the community much more meaningfully in our work. We invested an enormous amount, 30,000 submissions, over 1,000 meetings along the coast, innumerable relationships. Um, it makes a lot of sense to build on that rather than walk away from it. There is a tremendous reservoir of goodwill um, towards the protection and management and understanding of the Great Barrier Reef. It would be um, plain dumb if we didn't tap into that and work with the community. At the end of the day, it's the community who own the Great Barrier Reef and the community who will see any management successfully um, implemented. We have a range of, of um, monitoring programs that we, uh, that we coordinate together with others to help us uh, involve the community but also get useful information. On how, the, uh, on how the zoning plan and other aspects of our management are going. Um, and in particular, the cap reef exercise that is running out of central Queensland, Roslyn Bay, Yapoon, is uh, um, coordinated by the local recreational fishers down there with some scientific and, and uh, financial assistance from ourselves, is, is really well worthwhile having a look at in terms of um, involving the community in monitoring. I don't think I'll say much more about the, the zoning plan. Um, as I say, it's a significant outcome and the point that I really wanted to make there, I've made that it is, it is good. We absolutely need to be diligent about implementing and enforcing that, uh, that zoning plan um, and also adapting it and approve, improving it over time where possible. Um, I think there's a belief, and it's an unhealthy one in some quarters, that that's the job done now and that would be a big mistake. You may have heard much um, about how the zoning plan has had major economic implications. Most of that would be wrong and, uh, and self-serving. This is some data that we've collected um, on recreational fishing, uh, recreational vessels along the Great Barrier Reef and their registrations. You can see a steady trend upwards. Mm. That's when the new zoning came into effect. Um, if that's devastated the local recreational boating um, fraternity, then it's, uh, it's not showing up in the sales and so forth. So, how do we go about getting this information that we need? And, and I think, you know, as I say, that dialogues like this one are particularly important in that. Grabumpa has, the Marine Park Authority has always said that it wants to focus or wants to make sure that its decision making is well founded in science. And that remains the case today. That science includes both the natural and social sciences. There's a job there always. Relationships, as we know, are not things that you can just leave uh, in abeyance. There's a real need for us to work closely with the research community. The more closer, the better, as far as I'm concerned. There is, um, and I'll talk about some of the uh, things that uh, tend to divide us as opposed to bring us together shortly, 
but nevertheless the point stands that we need to work extremely closely with the research community. We have a comprehensive list of our information needs for management that we've gone through a process in-house and talking with researchers to refine what information do we need to deal with those sorts of problems that I talked about um, previously and other speakers have spoken about if we're going to do a good job. Um, that's on our website and um, it's a living document that we update from time to time, but please take the time to have a look at that. We have a science and technology group in Gabrumpa, which is headed up by Dr David Wackenfeld, who's here with us today, assisted by Lawrence McCook. Um, their, their job, and particularly research and monitoring, when we set it up, was to pass the ammo to the policy groups and to the managers. So if you like, they're the point people who interact with the research community, with the scientists, um, they're not the only ones in Gabrumpa, and that's, that's very important, but it's their job to take the latest science, the state of knowledge, and package it so that the policy makers and managers um, can utilise it. OK, I said I was going to have a bit, of a bit of a whinge complaint, so let me do that now. If you, you know, well, you're not going to stop me. What, <laughs> what worries me about research and science... There's that diplomacy thing I was talking about. What worries me about research and science in the marine environment? And I'm talking you know, both about the Great Barrier Reef and also um, more generally, and, you know, recently I've been, um, done some work in Nova Scotia and, and the Baltic up in northern Germany. One of the things that really worries me, and this particularly reflects my time in fisheries, is that research and, uh, and science is too often used to put decisions on hold. You know, we can't make decisions. We may, it may be the bleeding obvious, there may be a hillside slipping down onto a reef, but let's um, make sure that we've well and truly uh, you know, set up a, a whole research framework that would in, underpin any future decision making. Um, beam trawling in the, in, the area, in the inshore, beam trawling where they trawl you know, beams of about, uh, oh, I guess about 15 feet up and down um, the estuaries in southern Queensland. Um, there was no decision made on the impact of that until a whole lot of research that said, guess what? If you drag a big heavy iron beam along the bottom, you'll actually destroy some things, and in fact you'll destroy a fair few things. But I think, you know, the fact that we lost 10 years doing research was uh, a bit of a nonsense. The same sort of point, but if it's not measurable and testable, then it doesn't exist. You know, the issues we're talking about with sharks, at the moment there's a management plan being, being developed for sharks which relies on logbook data which came about from 1994, which started in 1994. It talks about sharks generally. There's no differentiation of species. Just remember what I said about the story about Saunders Beach. Um, you can see that uh, that's a recipe for um, getting it wrong. It becomes a bit of an end in itself at times. There's a disconnect between management and policy. And I, I see this quite a lot. And it, it struck me, particularly you know, in Germany, where I've been, where they have incredible technical capacity um, and, uh, and scientific knowledge, and some of the leading, particularly water quality um, scientists and, and deeper water um, fish species uh, scientists in the world, the Baltic's a mess, the North Sea's a mess, their inshore coasts a mess. Um, clearly, the science that they have is not feeding. In Japan, it's a similar story. And uh, the US and Canada, for instance, where I've just been talking with Canadians there, they've got some incredible, you know, skills and expertise and knowledge. Does it equal good outcomes? No, not always. Um, there's a tendency I, I find at time, and this may be related to, to personality, and it's not always a bad thing, but there's a tendency to focus on safe issues, particularly if the funding is linked to the, the relative controversy or conflict associated with any such research. Um, and uh, I don't have a lot of solutions for this, but I'm hoping in, in raising it that um, others may have, uh, others may be able to inform me. I think there's been, a, in, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef, I mean, there's an inadequate focus on economic and social research and geographical research. We don't understand the sense of place well enough there for the communities um, whose activities we are attempting to manage. And I will say that I think there's, there's an excessive emphasis I, I find on times on publishing in, in journals as opposed to 
actually uh, coming up with management solutions. Now, I don't downplay the importance of rigour and robust science and peer review and evaluation that's important. And um, nowhere has got a better record than that, I think, in, than the Centre for Excellence at, uh, at James Cook. But as I often think, I don't drive past too many bus stops on the way to work in the morning and see people reading the Journal of Gastropod Biology, you know, uh, and, and saying, you know, the, here, this, is, this is fantastic, you know, this is going to help protect the reef. I just don't, when I do see it, when I do see it, um, I'm prepared to uh, withdraw my comments. And it, and it can be a bit clubby and removed, you know. The, we, we, as human beings, we tend to do this. Um, we tend to, you know, seek solace and comfort and, uh, and self-reassurance amongst, uh, amongst our groups, and, and we tend to withdraw into those. And um, just before you walk out, I'm going to talk about what worries me about management and policy now um, for offended scientists, because I think there's some of these issues really need to be discussed much more, much more openly and they go to the heart of this issue of effectiveness of, you know, terrific science doesn't necessarily lead to good management. I think in asking why not, some of these issues are very pertinent. Um, management is obviously dealing, often, sorry, dealing with inadequate information and inadequate knowledge and expertise as well. And there's a bit of a trend, particularly in this town, for specialist skills to be downplayed or devalued and that you can basically if you're if you're an intelligent person you can turn your hand to anything quickly and don't get too caught up with it because in 12 months time you're going to be shifted or applying for a job somewhere else and I think that's a problem I think that's a real problem for management management often struggling often struggles to clearly define its objectives and we we would all there's reasons for all these things and as I said shocking generalizations but um, we, we need to get much better at articulating, defining what our objectives are so we can develop the strategies in a much more rational way. I think there's a real danger with management of this multi-layered decision making which essentially leads to non-decision making and that's where you have a, a problem which is obvious, decline, massive decline in dugongs, you know 15 years later you're still working your way through committees um, up to the uh, up to the decision maker. Oops, the dugongs are gone. Um, managers are often risk adverse, and and the political process increasingly, I think, tends to uh, to drive this. That if you want a successful career in the management agencies or in the bureaucracy, don't get caught up in anything too dodgy or difficult, because it could backfire, and your career could be could be a result in failure. You get rewarded too often for playing it safe as opposed to taking on the issues. Big problem. I think managers need to get out more, um, and I mean by that into the park. Um, they need to have a much better understanding, and I'm talking particularly about Kabumpa here, about the resources that we're managing and the people that we're managing. Um, and it's, it's an unfortunate thing that if, you, if you're going off to Lizard Island, uh, you know, often or particularly um, from in this town, if you, you know, if you said you're going to Lizard Island for a week to have a look at the, the impacts of coral bleaching on the local tourism industry, that would be seen as a major indulgence and, and frowned upon. Our, our data management is poor. I think this is true of most management agencies. We collect data, use it for short-term purposes, forget where we put it, forget what it was about, probably go and spend money collecting the same data again 10 years down the track. We have to get much better at that. Um, it's a real problem for management agencies. We don't spend enough time focusing on evaluating our effectiveness um, and how we've gone. And um, I think that's a criticism that holds truth. And we have difficulties linking management needs with research funding. And I think that's a problem around the world, but uh, it's one that we need, to, we need to address much more significantly. Let me say, as other speakers have said, in Australia, it's about as good as it gets, um, but that's not to say that there's not significant room for improvement. So what's next for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in the Marine Park, or, or those of us who are involved, and I include scientists and researchers in this? We need to get better at integrating information, and a number of speakers have referred to that. We need to get better at understanding patterns of use over space and time, and especially at a more localised and regionalised scale. 
and a number of other, several speakers last night spoke about how local communities relate to their resources locally. European or white Australians are no different along the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, certainly the traditional owners relate locally. Um, and yet much of our management focus has been usefully on an ecosystem-wide basis. I think in the future we need to get much better at, uh, at focusing on the regional um, level. We have the Outlook Report, a significant body of work being headed up by John Day, who's with us. Um, it is seeking to identify the pressures, measure the pressures, evaluate the management, and hopefully come up with, uh, with clear arguments for where we need to go in the future. It's going to rely heavily on the input of both the research community and the broader community, as well as managers. One thing that we are losing the battle on, and a gentleman was very articulate um, and passionate about it last night, I thought, when talking about the Whit Sundays in the public forum, is this uh, addressing of cumulative impacts. And the Whit Sundays, which he was referring to, is a case in point. So we, we have tools which allow us to focus in on this resort development or, or this uh, operation, which, but we, we don't have tools and we struggle to deal with it in a cumulative sense. And so the death by a thousand cuts um, issue is a, is a problem. We have got some monitoring in place for the zoning plan. That can be improved upon. It's underfunded at the moment. Um, and particularly the non-reefal habitats, I think we need to, we need to um, find the resources and the wherewithal and the tools to better focus on that. Um, I've spoken about social and economic information. Um, and I'd add into that political information. And I don't mean in the, in the big P sense, I mean in the small P sense. And this issue of community engagement and partnership, what I'll call a process of letting go, of really getting away from the top-down approach, handing over stewardship to local communities, making sure that they understand the issues. I mean, if, I, if I could have packaged up a lot of that information that was presented to us yesterday and last night, um, I'm sure that it would be arouse a great deal of interest in Mackay Cairns, Innisfail, Curramine, Gladstone. You know, people want to know that stuff. They want to understand it and they want to be able to use it in, in coming to their own judgments. Um, we have a certain arrogance about us, I think, in terms of um, treating, tending to think that the community is this benign group that we will hand things to and they'll be in awe of our expertise and our, our obvious intelligence. And I think that's a very bad mistake and uh, we have to get much better at actually handing over the stewardship to the local community. So what would enable us to do a better job going on with it? We obviously rely on a better understanding of the ecosystem. And if anyone's in doubt about that, then the discussions on shark um, that occurred yesterday, Sean's presentation, and uh, I know Howard's going to talk on it a bit uh, more, I mean, what is the impact? I spoke about dugongs before, removing you know, 47,000 major grazing herbivores out of a system. Um, what is the impact on the overall functioning of the system of removing that top trophic level, or at least the marine trophic level of sharks and major predators? We don't really understand that. I'll just talk a little bit, and I'm running out of time, I'm aware, but um, we treat biodiversity as if it's a free good, essentially. We value it in a marketplace for fillets, or for live fish for that matter, or for fins. To my mind, this is a major mistake because it's obviously not the true value, and we've seen it in terms of the tourism industry, and we know that nothing stimulates German or American or, or French or Australian divers for that matter and makes them more likely to come back and spend money doing it again than seeing big things under the water. And, and we've all been out on vessels where, you know, people have come back in awe because they saw a large groper or they saw, you know, a large shark or, or even a shark these days. But we don't value the biodiversity of the fish in that way. And when I raised this at a, at a recent industry, fishing managers and industry meeting, um, I was, ex you know, howled down because they want, to, they want to manage it as though the fish have value for either recreational fishing or commercial fishing, but nothing else. And this is where we're going very wrong. And you can see the discussion on the carbon tax 
It's exactly the same, it's exactly the same discussion. If you treat something as a free good or without cost, then you'll undervalue it, you'll squander it, um, you know, it, and, the, and the implications won't be taken into account. Biodiversity is highly undervalued. We have no pricing mechanism other than through the market to eat it. Um, and we, we need, I think, to do better than that. And perhaps having the ex-head uh, of uh, the Bureau of Statistics here would be, is a good thing in that regard. I've spoken about the sense of place. What are people's fears, aspirations, pleasures, desires in relation to the marine park and the Great Barrier Reef? If you don't understand those, then um, I suspect all the science in the world is not going to help you with altering their behaviour or influencing their behaviour. Um, what also enables us to do a better job? Um, I think at some stage we have to realise that fish, crustaceans, mollusks, cephalopods are actually part of the ecosystem and need to be managed as part of the ecosystem. Taking them out and managing them as separate stocks is clearly a nonsense. The institutional arrangements that we have in this country where we have fish managed over here, ecosystems managed over there, is an institutional uh, nightmare and nonsense. Um, and I know that much of the fisheries legislation refers to the need to manage on an ecological basis. Unfortunately, I think that can best be described as elegant rhetoric. It doesn't measure up in reality to the, uh, to the way it's actually implemented. I'm not um, someone who's a great believer in, uh, in policemen being out in the park. However, the fact remains that we must have a comprehensive and effective compliance system in place for the zoning plan and for the permit system and for our management. Um, and we need more of that at the moment. It's much, much better than what it used to be, much more effective. Our field managers are uh, um, becoming increasingly focused on intelligence and use of technology, and that's helping. 22 detections of line fishing, illegal line fishing on the swains in the last three weeks. Um, the dead dugong unreported off Armstrong Beach. We got a trawler in the green the night before last. You know, it's... It's very related to price um, and it's also related to this deterrence effect. If people don't believe that there's any enforcement capacity out there, then it'll be a sort of me too mentality um, and we're not, ahead, we're not on top of that yet. We need to understand what's coming at us down the pipe in terms of particularly uh, developments in the demand for seafood and other products out of China and India and so forth. In 1995, it was obvious that the live fish trade was taking off, largely being driven through Hong Kong. Increasingly, that's Shanghai and other Chinese cities. We didn't manage in terms of what was coming, so we ended up having to um, deal with a policy debt in a, in a uh, situation that led to, led to, I think, inadequate management outcomes in terms of the reef line fishery. And I'd like to see a much more engaged an active science and research community, I'd like to see more of these sorts of forums. How many of the people out there know that there's a management plan being prepared for sharks in the Great Barrier Reef? So there's a couple. How many people have put in a submission to that process? This, okay, this process is about to set up the future management arrangements for sharks. We heard Sean, and we'll hear Howard shortly, talk about the problems. The scientific and research community is not engaged in that policy debate. And it absolutely needs to be. It's about to entrench a take, a legal take of about 1,000 tonnes, 700 tonnes commercial and 300 tonnes recreational. It's based on logbook data from 1994 and less, dealing with all sharks. I mean, it's clearly a nonsense. But it'll happen, and we'll have this parallel universe of us at forums or scientists talking about the problem and policy makers over here coming up with a flawed solution. The science, and I, and, I, and I know the sensitivities around this issue, I was at the ACRS meeting on Magnetic Island when it nearly you know, caused a walkout 
at the, at the society. But to my mind, science acting like a high church off to one side, which doesn't have opinions and doesn't get involved, is a strange sort of um, Dr. Strangelove sort of a world. Now, let me go on to say that scientists in this room have directly and actively contributed to the good management of the Great Barrier Reef. And through the rezoning, we could not have achieved the rezoning if it wasn't for the work and the advocacy of scientists like Ove, Terry, um, Gary, and I don't want to name people, but they stood up. They did it in a very robust and rigorous scientific way, but it had an extremely telling effect on policy makers. The rezoning went through both houses of our parliament unanimously. I'm getting the wind up here, so I'll have to move on. Um, we need to resource our traditional owners, particularly in the more remote areas of the park, to actively undertake management. The, the Wooderty people of Shelburne Bay and Temple Bay can manage that area for, I reckon, about one half of the cost that it will cost us to do it. Um, but the resources aren't, aren't there. And of course, less CO2 would be a good thing. OK, I just repeat, the Gabrumpa could not have achieved world-class management without the support and expertise of the marine research and science community. Now, I'm not sure who's who on the tractor, you know, which one's Gabrumpa and which one's the scientific community, and it probably uh, doesn't matter. The point's made that that keeps the thing uh, heading. And just on that note, I wonder if I could uh, just ask Gary Russ to, to step forward for a moment. He's